the innovations that have been driven by a market funded, system. Funded by the, basically the US taxpayer. But Everything in the iPhone comes out. No, that's true. Th that is completely nonsense. No, that is completely no, that's a There are a few specific fact. patents that can be linked back to some no, specific HTML, technologies. HTML, touchscreens, lithium batteries, no, 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 microprocessors. I'm conscious of the fact that when we talk about Marxism uh, and capitalism, we can very quickly get into caricatured perspectives with regards to these terms. So I'd really love for each of you to lay out um, in a few words, what is your vision of these terms? What do they mean and what do they look like? Not just theoretically, but in practice. Matthew. Sure, well, thank you very much for the opportunity to, to be here today and, and be part of this debate, I'm, I'm looking forward to it very much. I mean, I suppose at a premise, I see capitalism or market system as uh, a model based upon the idea of free exchange, of uh, people being able to make decisions about their own lives, and then through the, the market and the decisions they make, uh, freely deciding our economic course. Um, it's a highly decentralized system. Uh, it's a system that I think has proven extremely successful. Uh, over human history. I mean, I, I basically um, accept that for most of human history, life was pretty much nasty, brutish, and short, as, as Thomas Hobbes famously said. And what capitalism has delivered us is an immense level of prosperity over the last 200 years. We've gone from over 90% of people in extreme poverty down to 10%, um, where we've seen life expectancy double, we've seen global inequality has even declined. Um, and quite frankly, over the last 30 years, we've even seen amazing progress, as we've seen liberalisations in more countries um, looking at moves towards markets in China or India or, or in uh, all over East Asia. Um, I think what we're going to end up in this trap in this debate is uh, there's, there's always this potential, I think, and, and Aaron uh, sometimes falls prey to it, and I guess sometimes so do I, but you can have this idea of this ideal world and you say, well, capitalism uh, hasn't delivered us everything we want out of, out of society. But I think you actually have to, you know, and I'm willing to take on, uh, to some extent, the, the, the criticisms of capitalism and all, all the warts it has, and say, I think that's better than any other system that's ever been tried in human history. And generally speaking, when social systems have been tried, it has resulted in huge amounts of poverty, destitution, and, and uh, enslavement of um, humanity. And I don't think that's... Uh, something you can just dismiss and say, well, that's not what Marxism wanted. You know, of course, Marxism did not want uh, the Berlin Wall or gulags or anything like that. But I think that a system which has failed every time in practice is probably one that fails in theory as well. And there are fundamental systematic reasons why Marxism never actually works in practice. And that's because it pushes against um, much of the way we, w we should want to operate society uh, and, and therefore inevitably fails. And if we're going to be persuaded here in this debate that uh, Marxism is a better system, you have to tell me why it's not going to end up in the same miserable situation it has every single other time it has been tried. Why will this time be different? How will we organise society? Who will, who will do, um, allocate the means of production? What jobs will I be able to do? What happens if I, if I do want a voluntary exchange and I want to work for somebody in, as, an employee, as an employee? Uh, you're not going to let me do that. What if I want to buy a product at a certain price? Are you going to stop me from doing that? What, what is it actually going to mean? How are you going to solve what is effectively the, 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 um, the problem that Hayek highlighted here, which is the knowledge problem? Who's going to choose how to allocate resources in what way? So I think I might leave my, my opening thoughts there and look forward to discussion. Aaron, um, over to you. and Tell us about your vision, uh, Marxism as you see it and as you define it. Well, firstly, I, I, love, I love the example of China because, of course, every failure of China is because of the Chinese Communist Party and the failures of state socialism. But every success, taking 700 people out of economic deprivation, now having a longer life expectancy than the United States, by the way, Cuba does as well. Those are nothing to do with state intervention or non-market policies. Just a, it's a thing to dwell on, isn't it? All the upside, well, that's markets. All the downside, that's, that's nothing to do with us, Gov. In terms of Marxism, I, I would sort of add some caveats to what was said previously. So I think Marxism is a, is a worldview and it's an interpretation of how market economics works. And you can be a currency trader and be a Marxist. I mean, I know some of them. <laughs> um, so I, I, I wouldn't say that just because somebody claims to be a Marxist, they have an attachment to defending a set of regimes here in the 21st century. I think it goes far more deeply than that. When Marx wrote Capital, the full title of that book was Capital, A Critique of Political Economy. He was criticizing the liberal political economy of the Manchester School, English econ economists generally, not just English economists, but generally speaking, 
of Ricardo, Smith, Jevons. And he said, actually, we'll go back to the start of this conversation, utopian vision, Marxism. No, far from it. He was critiquing what he viewed as a utopian vision. That was the whole point of capital. It was a critique of these ideas, which were increasingly hegemonic. Sorry, there's not a better word I can probably use right now. Uh, which were increasingly hegemonic amongst the British ruling class, European ruling classes, which effectively went around the world. So how does Marxism help us? I would say it helps us in at least, in at least two areas. Firstly, it helps us understand economic development far more astutely. Why does something happen? Why are certain commodities made? Why do, does the global economy look the way it does? I, I think there are, very, well, I'll be honest, I think there's no other better explanation actually than effectively Marxist perspectives. All of what we're looking around here is embedded within a metaphysics. Everything from this pen to my shoes, to these trousers, they were all made for exchange value, for profit. They wouldn't have been made without it. And the beauty of Marxism is it helps you to break down some of the contradictions in social life to better understand what, what that means, right? So for you, I presume, history unfolds because some powerful people do stuff, some great men achieve some great things, and uh, it's, it's just quite happenstance. Going to the second point about the uses of Marxism from economics to history, well, actually, no, we can look at things like demographics, we can look at things like technological change, geopolitics, and we can have a materialist conception of history. And in the 21st century, as much as people like to, you know, dish it out on Karl Marx and Marxists, pretty much everybody agrees that actually history unfolds as a result of material circumstances. When he writes the German ideology in the mid-19th century, that's quite a bold statement, okay? So in a way, we are all Marxists now when it comes to history. Uh, I won't go on to his contribution to literary theory, arguably just as big, I'm not Terry Eagleton, uh, but to stick to the first point I made about economics, he is the first to really understand that these crises you see in capitalism aren't accidental and they're not one-offs. And by the way, in the mid 19th century, people weren't so sure. They thought, and, and by the way, that liberal political economists thought, well, we've had a, an economic crash here, but that's because of these particular reasons, those particular reasons. Marx says no, because of inbuilt contradictions within capitalism, which maybe even Matthew agrees with. I mean, again, we're all Marxists now in so much as we know there are crises attendant within capitalism. They happen regularly. They are inevitable. That wasn't something that was generally agreed on in the mid 19th century. So again, he's built a consensus that we don't really talk about. Um, Marxism for me provides the best framework by which to understand why decisions are made by, by people operating within a capitalist framework and why they can, can fail. Uh, and so for me as a Marxist, I look at, for instance, the global financial crisis, 2007, eight, you have declining rates of profitability from industrial capital. There's less profit being made by capitalists in countries like West Germany, the United States, right across Western Europe. So of course, if you're a capitalist, you want high rates of profit. What do you do? You go into financial speculation, you go into real estate, you go into reinsurance, much higher margins, much higher rate of return. But of course, too much capital goes into these sectors. We have massively over-financialized housing markets in the US and across Europe, and the whole thing collapsed in 2007-8. Now, if you're a Marxist, you see that coming. And that's why Marxism is very useful. And if you're a Marxist, by the way, you can see what's coming over the next 5, 10, 15 years, which is, again, declining rates of profit, declining rates of growth, particularly in East Asia. What does that generally mean if you're a historical materialist? Well, as a Marxist, you look back at the early 20th century, the Great War between the European powers. And you can understand how declining profit and increased economic competition between great powers with really important senses of national identity can spill over into real bloody warfare. That's a blind spot for people like Matthew. It's not for Marxists. So that's why I like being a Marxist, very proudly so. Uh, in the medium term, I, I'm, I'd call myself a luxury communist because my book is about where our species goes over the next two, three, four hundred years, I believe that what we're seeing with automation right now is just as big a shift as the Industrial Revolution. The consequences will be enormous. We can't begin to understand them in a hundred years' time. That's why I call myself a luxury communist, because I think we'll see the end of that division between labour and capital, leisure and work. In the meantime, in the here and now, I'm just a social democrat. I'm very boring. I'm a Marxist radical social democrat, which, by the way, is more in line with how most people think about public services, energy, housing, work, taxing the rich, than what Matthew's saying. So I think it's time we stop painting Marxists as these dangerous radicals and put us where we belong, the voice of common sense.
I mean, Marxism claimed to be a scientific theory, and in those terms, we also do have to critique it, because it said uh, capitalism would inevitably come to the end, its own contradictions uh, would, would destroy itself, this would happen in the most developed places. Now, of course, as a scientific theory, Marxism has been an abject and total failure. There, there hasn't been this great rise up of people who've said, down with the system. In terms of, is everyone a materialist now historian? I mean, I studied history. I, I, I didn't think everyone was a materialist historian. There might be some historians in the room who disagree. There's, there's obviously lots of different theories about history. I mean, I've, I've no doubt that there is some value in, you know, reading Marx. You know, you should read your classical thinkers. But in terms of, as a political system, or in terms of historical theory, I think it's an abject failure uh, in every conceivable way and, and shouldn't be something you should be proud of um, in whatsoever. Just in, out of interest, um, in terms of the models that you both advocate, what countries would you identify as kind of being the best representations of those models? Look, yeah, I don't think there's any country that I wouldn't largely criticise for loads of different reasons and it's, it's many flaws. But I think the, the generally free market countries that have been quite successful in terms of market relations, you can look at uh, up until recently somewhere like Hong Kong, you could look at uh, Australia, New Zealand, the UK, the US have all been some of the, the richest countries as well as Western European, increasingly some Eastern European countries. Uh, in terms of actually existing economic regimes, which I agree with and I think are very positive, this is going to sound cliche from somebody on the left, Scandinavia, Finland is the happiest country on earth. Um, they have markets. I'm not suggesting otherwise. By the way, there are markets in my book too. I call, I, well, no, it's called Fully Automated Electric Communism. I think that's a con contradiction. It's, it's talked about in there. There are markets in there too. There have been experiments in, you know, socialising finance markets and how that can help expedite worker ownership, for instance. So the idea that necessarily socialism and markets are two completely different things isn't necessarily accurate. In fact, the left tradition before Marx was, was they were called Ricardian socialists. It's quite a strange thing to think now. You have people like David Ricardo inspiring socialists, but they, they did exist. So market socialism is a thing, and I'm not particularly averse to markets. Where you embrace markets, about, it's about who has access to credit and capital, right? And, and, and so who, who gets the money to invest in the businesses and why and under what conditions? Um, under the conditions we have, wealthy asset owners get capital to buy more assets so that we can pay them more rents, so they can expand. Workers can't get access to capital. And you see this a beautiful example of this, by the way, is in the UK housing market. Until very recently, if you wanted to get property, the easiest, easiest way to get property is to buy property and to get more property. Now, Matthew can say, well, there are some disincentives. Buy to let mortgages aren't, aren't as generous as regular mortgages. You need more credit for a deposit. That's all true. But once you have that revenue stream, those rents coming in, you can expand your property portfolio. Meanwhile, home ownership in this country is falling. It's, been, it's, it's well below where it was in 2007, 8. And I do find this kind of presumption that the world's getting better. We're so happy. Markets are working. Well, Life expectancy is stagnating or falling in the United States over the last several years. Of course, COVID is a huge part of that. Uh, but if you look at this country, uh, home ownership, life expectancy, debt, all going in the wrong direction. Self-reported happiness, you know, I, I agree. It's a very sort of, it can be quite flaky and, and too relativistic. But it's quite clear to me that countries going in the right direction, Finland, Sweden, I think with the exception of their immigration policy, Denmark, but qu quite obvious to me. So... I, I'm, I'm quite pragmatic as a, as a Marxist. I think they are nullifying the worst excesses of market capitalism. And again, going back to Marx, that's what the book was called, Critique of Political Economy. And finally, sorry, he had a great line, which kind of undermines what Matthew was saying. I'm not here to write recipes for the cookshops of the future, which is a great shame. But this idea that Marx was this propositional thinker telling people to go around murdering others, inaccurate. Now, you can say many people have suffered in his name. Absolutely correct. But... None of that is anywhere in any of his books, which you should read. If you take the example of, of housing, which has just come up here. Now, I do not think under anyone's imagination that there is a free market or anything like a free market in housing in this country. There is the Town and Country Planning Act that overwhelmingly restricts the building of housing. The UK has built houses much slower than any other country uh, around, well, not any other country, but most other major countries around Europe, um, that we've got a, a huge strangulation on the housing supply because of a, a regulatory intervention. And that is at the cause of so many economic and social issues, including, you could argue, the increased inequality, um, put together low interest rates, have um, increased the value of people's capital assets. Again, that's a market uh, intervention. Now, I think overall the story when it comes to capitalism and inequality is, is something that people completely misread um, in, in so many different ways. In the first instance, the, the truth is that global inequality, if, if you do a Gini coefficient between individuals, has actually declined uh, in the last 100 years. And that's because the, the, it's not just like 1% of people who 
live in palaces now, um, can have access to luxuries. But more or less, the great power of capitalism is bringing luxuries to everyone. If you just compare um, to 1998, which is in the scheme of things not really that long ago, um, just 10% of British households had an internet connection, 27% had a phone, and 33% had a computer. Those are now up to 89, 95, and 88% respectively. You've got a system which, using the profit incentive, rewards people for innovation, rewards people for creating things. Um, profit is the reward you get for um, creating a good whose parts is equal, uh, come to, you've made together is equal more than the cost of it made to produce. So I think that the, the profit motive in the market system has delivered these, these innovations that have made things like an iPhone in my pocket with extraordinary ca um, technological capacity accessible to the masses. And this is actually where I get confused by Aaron's whole philosophy, be be because he talks about luxury communism, but in fact everything that he seems to love has come out of a capitalistic system. It's come out of the innovations that have been driven by a market funded, system. Funded by the, basically the US taxpayer. But everything in the iPhone comes out. No, that's true. Th that is completely nonsense. No, that is completely no, that's a there are a few specific fact. patents that can be linked back to some no, specific HTML, technologies. HTML, touchscreens, lithium batteries, no, no, no. microprocessors. We are not going to make this about the iPhone. So um, <laughs> no, we, no, you can pick this up afterwards all by all means. No, it's not. Um, I do want to give Aaron a chance to come back on this. All the things you're talking about, inequality falling, well, actually, for the first 40, 50 years of the Industrial Revolution, living standards don't increase, even though we do have an extraordinary increase in productivity and, and innovation, absolutely. They only start to increase when you get worker organizing, collective action, people asking for more money. And I find it incredible that basically your argument is, well, we got rid of child slavery laws, we got the eight hour day, we got the, we got the weekend, we've got a socialized healthcare, and it's all thanks to the bosses. I mean, nobody thinks that. Not even the bosses think that. So all the progress, yes, there's been a great deal of progress that's been created by markets, technological innovation. Absolutely, of course there has. I like markets. I like technological innovation. Much of it, by the way, funded by the US taxpayer, which is referring to. But at the same time, those, those, those contractions in inequality and those improvements in, in, in living standards for all of us are because people fought for them. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.